Welcome everybody to Access Europe July and Alexander is leading this month's session as you may have already read he's from Warsaw in Poland and this is a project that he first developed several years ago and it's been on YouTube for some years at the address that you can see on this slide here. The versions that you will see on YouTube are somewhat out of date in terms of he's made many changes recently um, and the, certainly the newest versions are even more impressive than they were before. Anyone who isn't able to stay till the end to, to hear me say this later again, on my Isle of Dogs website, AEU17, I have already put three files there for you to download the PDF of the presentation and the two example databases. And I will also add these to the Access Europe user group website in the next day or so as well. Okay, so Alexander has been programming for many years, although he is significantly younger than the typical age group of many Access developers, which is an excellent sign. Nowadays, he's actually working in other areas as well as Access, and he will mention some of the th ways that he's using these ideas elsewhere later on. And welcome, Alexander. Welcome once more. Uh, my name is Alexander Wojtasz. I'm from Poland and today I will be presenting my invention, Interactive Gantt Chart Scheduler in Access. I believe this solution is uh, worth attention because this is only using the standard Microsoft Access, pure Microsoft Access, together with some operating system function calls. So no other components is needed to achieve uh, following effects. But maybe I will tell a little bit about myself. As Colin mentioned, I'm a programmer. My first professional start as Access programmer was in 2005. So I'm already programming in Access for over 15 years. I'm, I was doing first uh, the very standard typical things in Access, but later I was exploring uh, Microsoft Access areas deeper and deeper. So now I'm using Access not only in the typical way, but as, as you will soon uh, in not very typical way. Yeah, and, and today, nowadays I'm working as a programmer in the uh, banking company. But earlier, most of my professional career I have spent as programmer in the production uh, companies where scheduling and, and presenting the data on the timeline is very important. So this is a little introduction about myself. And maybe today uh, I will start from a little teaser. What are, is the final product or database we are going to discuss today? So maybe I will switch to, to Microsoft Access. So you, you can see this is the sample database. Uh, this database, as Colin mentioned, will be available on the uh, Colin website and as well on the Access User Group website. So this will be available for download and presentation. We can see this is timeline. We can assume this is the one working day. We can see the technicians because this uh, sample was intended to schedule some workshop that is repairing cars. Here are the technicians, the rectangles are the production orders. And what is extraordinary in this database, as you see when I'm moving my mouse over the layout, it is reacting. So it is highlighting the rectangles. Moreover, when I click and I'm using mouse down, and most move, the rectangles are moving. We can as well extend the timeline. We can uh, double click. So it is causing pop-up window is open it. We can change some details here. Maybe I will just type, doesn't matter, something important. So we can see the, the detail are changed. The colors of the rectangles are the status. So we have a couple of the statuses like in progress part order, and each status is visible as different color on the layout as well. And of course we can still change the hours here. So anytime we, we change something in the form, it is changing the, the mm, layout. And of course there is available right mouse click menu. We can add new job something is on, we can uh, go to some other uh, date. The uh, new jobs are 
by default inserted in the unassigned area. Later, we can fill in some details. Status is, of course, the field where we should choose only the positions available in the drop-down list. And later, we can we can schedule the work order. Yeah, so it is the little a little demonstration, but now I will go deeper in the in the details as it was uh, already written. The database is using the GDI Windows library, which is default Microsoft Windows component that is used to draw elements on all the Microsoft Windows forms, except the hardware accelerated applications because they are using different type of uh, rendering. But still, most of the applications is using this low level library. To gradually involve all of you with the techniques I use, uh, I created first some little demonstration database that is describing the very basic operations of this graphics library. So maybe first I will demonstrate the tool set we have here in this library and how we can use those tools. And later gradually I will explain more advanced concepts so how we can use that tools to build something more advanced. So this database is called GDI library test. It is pretty simple. Here is as well embedded the same module named it canvas, but in general, this module is used to change standard Microsoft access image control to object that is capable to draw the things in real time. The things may be lines, maybe rectangles, maybe text, maybe as well pictures. Uh, maybe I will first go to the design mode. Uh, here, after I select it, you can see this is very standard image, but there is no data actually. So you see picture is known, means that there is no picture inside but when we go to the from the design mode to the production mode you see there is nothing white area and maybe i will i will demonstrate how we can draw lines so the draw line is just a function that takes two pair of coordinates x1 y1 are the coordinates of first uh, beginning of the line and x2 y2 are the coordinates of end of the line. So here I'm clicking draw line. You see the line is, is drawn. When I'm moving my mouse over the layout, the this in these text boxes, we can see the, the actual coordinate. Maybe I will change the beginning to something like this, 45, maybe here 120 draw line. You see the, the line is drawn uh, differently. Uh, this one clear picture is just for uh, cleaning the the picture and of course we can change the color of the line so so now the line is drawn in red color as well we can change the thickness so now the line is really thick and we can of course draw the line with thickness one there is one special uh, uh, characteristic of the lines that have uh, thickness one we can change the style of the line. Default is solid, but we can have different styles like dash or dash dot. So I think this is pretty self-explanatory how the drawing lines works. In the second step is another important tool. It's drawing rectangles. So here this function as well is required two set of coordinates. So left top corner and top uh, bot uh, bottom right corner as well thickness. So now I can draw the rectangle, but you can see in the, the library is keeping by default the parameters of the four color, which is the border color and the back color is default the color of the background of the shape that is already drawn. There is as well some function to draw rectangle with rounded corners. There is as finally the function in the library that is capable to draw polygons. And here, each pair of the numbers are the subsequent coordinates x, y of the corners. So here is the little information how we can draw rectangles and polygons. So we are going to the third tab. Here is the important part of drawing text. Here is much more parameters, but they are pretty self-explanatory. We have a font name, size, bold, italic, 
and of course the coordinates of the text area. Maybe I will change the four color, but the colors are working in the same way. Font color is the same as line color. So you see here is the text. Maybe I will change access, access, access user group. I'm not sure. A <laughs> like that, right? So, so the text is, of course, we can change the alignment. We can change the font style. Maybe I will extend a little bit the, the rectangle. We can see how the things are working. Maybe I will use different font. Yeah, so it is the way how we can put the text in our library. Maybe I will put some more change little bit coordinates and show that, see, the, there is another rectangle with text driven, uh, drawn. And of course, there is uh, one more feature, draw rectangle around text. So in case there is this tick box is unchecked, the text is only drawn without the background rectangle. Final function is just the put image. So we can, uh, the image is already remembered in the memory. So we can put the image in the same way there are the co coordinates of the left top corner, but this time we are specifying the width and height of the of the picture. Maybe I will make it twice as big as, as it was. So we see, and of course we can put the picture without keeping the aspect ratio of the original picture. It may be also useful. Yeah, so, so it is pretty basic demonstration how the library is working. Now I will just spend a little time to explain how the code looks like. Begin from the slides because I, I presented a little quote of the articles we can find in intranet. So uh, first is information, uh, what is GDI? Of course, though these slides will be published as well on the access user group website and call-in website. So, so anyone will be able to uh, look on that slides deeper and here are the original source of the articles. So it is just a little explanation. What is GDI? That is just the Windows operating system graphical interface. GDI is just the library we will be using. Part of that library is the file that is called GDI32DLL. So this file is responsible for all the drawing function. And we, we can uh, read more about this here on this uh, below this hyperlink. Question, how we can call the, in general, the operating system functions from DLL libraries uh, from our DBA code? Uh, of course, we can, we can declare such an functions with use declare statement and define all the parameters that the function is taking. And, and later we can use in our project that function in, in Visual Basic. The important part is pointer safe is the part which is introduced after Office was changed to 64 bits. So it is kind of new way of declaring to keep the compatibility with the wider range of the addressing. So now, now addresses are in memory are 64 bits, but it is kind of, uh, we can omit this declare statement, not only in GDI, but very often uh, these statements are used in different circumstances. Now it's a little explanation because the graphic GDI library sometimes is using as the input parameters, the data structures. Uh, this is an example that function that is called create deep section requires a parameter that is not a simple data type like long or, or string or integer, but it require a parameter that is structure. Here is some little explanation how looks the, the original declaration of that function. So, so we see that some of the pointer is required, but we can easily solve this, implement this with declaring the type in Visual Basic that is uh, having exactly the same structure as the type that is defined in the original library documentation. So it is the, how it looks in original library uh, documentation in C++ and exactly the same fields are in Visual Basic. As we now know what is GDI, how we can make use of GDI library inside Visual Basic and Microsoft Access, time to go deeper what actually we have for 
our purposes. So we have actually two central objects. The first one is a device context and the second is deep uh, device independent bitmap. Device context we can assume is kind of canvas that is used for drawing and device independent bitmap we can assume is kind of bitmap that resides inside memory and all the drawing operations are made in the memory a device bitmap and later in final stage we are transferring this memory picture to our image control in access. Yeah, so, so here is some little uh, more detailed ex explanation. It's just a hyperlink to the article. More detailed explanation what is deep this device independent bitmap are uh, heard as two sources so someone who is more interested can read that articles. Of course we have these two things uh, this dib with this, which is a memory device independent context and the device deep and device context. So we need to join them together to make use of them. So it is, it is the way how we are joining. We are joining this use of the select object. It's also a GDI function. We are attaching the device context to the memory picture. And since this moment we can draw with the the things in the on our picture and the last i'm only referring to this as a boring theory but soon we will uh, see how it really works in, in our code so it is the last one uh, piece of theory that this is how we structured the bitmap uh, bitmap file uh, some kind of bitmap file header bitmap info header and the bits this is whole table but it is used only when uh, we are using something else than 24 bits uh, as the depth of, of colors. So we are creating in our memory such a structure that keeps all the details about our bitmap and later all the bits are just placed one after one in the subsequent area of the memory. So here is the little information how the transferring DIB to Microsoft image control looks like. Even if we draw something, the, all the, the bits and the bytes are changed in the memory, but to see them in our Microsoft Access form, we need to transfer somehow with the memory area that holds the bitmap to our image control. So it is little information that we are defining some memory picture table that is the array of bits and later we are just copying the first the uh, in the first 40 bits uh, the header and later rest of this area will uh, be occupied by just simple pixels each pixel occupy 24 bits 8 bits per each color and and later we are just assigning this memory picture table to our image control that is located in microsoft access form so this is the way how we are transferring the memory picture into our access form. And now, if we know how the general idea looks like, so we know that we have device context, we have memory picture, and after each drawing operation is made, we are transferring the, the peak memory picture to the image control. But how looks the drawing activity looks in the same way as, as the other. We need to define some objects that are brush, which is assumed to be the background color. We are defining another object that is a pen and the pen is the object that is assumed as the order, border style and border color. And as, as well, we are defining the current font. And anytime uh, when the object is created, we are using the same function select object that is attaching the current pen, current font and current brush to the graphics to the device context so we are we can assume that anytime we would like to change the brush to the to some new brush we are creating new brush and selecting the new brush by this select object function so the and the old brush we are getting handled to the old brush but the old brush is always destroyed because it, it's good practice to clean up the the resources we know how we can define a uh, change our brush so there are the we can assume there are the global settings of the of the application. We know how to define pen and font. So here are the little more functions. So here is the line code how we can draw lines. But drawing lines is not the 
one tap operation. First, we are using move to, so it is moving to the beginning point, and later is another function line to, so it is going to the end coordinates. So, so it is two stages operation. And of course, here are some examples how the move to and line to declarations of the function looks like. So the, that two functions, move to and line to, are exact function from this GDA32 library. And here as well, on the right side of the slide, were mentioned the declarations of that function that are used in the code, but they are pure Windows operating system uh, function that came from GDA32 library. Okay, we know how to draw lines. The same story with the rectangles. So there is function rectangle, the same. We are first defining brush and, and pen. Of course, we are drawing the rectangle and later we are cleaning up the, the resources because anytime the, something is drawn, we need first create pen and brush. And after the uh, drawing is finished, we need to clean up. But explaining how in detail is how it works, but actually later I will explain that all the functions are defined in the class. So, so the class is actually taking care about it. We need, as the user of the class, we just, we are calling the drawing operation in the much simple way. So it is one more slide that describes how we can draw the font. It is the same thing. We are using the draw text function from the GDI library. And before we draw text, we need to create the current font and we are using this function. And this is the last explanation. This is how we are defining the memory pictures because it is pretty often that we'd like to show some small icon or some image in our layout so we can first capture some existing file from the drive and later and store it in another uh, memory picture. And later we are using this function that is called Fetch build. This function is used to copy data from one memory picture to another. In our case, from this source memory picture to the our layout memory picture. And we can, of course, stretch these memory pictures, means that the destination size not necessarily needs to be the same as the source size. And it is little uh, mentioned how the function looks like in original documentation of, of GDI uh, library. So the parameters are pretty much the same. All right, so it is the explained how the library is working. And the next chapter is the deeper description of mouse events. So this one is the explanation how we can react on our mouse moves in our layout. So picture, all the other objects, image control can react on multiple mouse events. It's not just simple click or double click, but we can as well engage the mouse move, mouse down, mouse up events. And those events are giving us more parameters. The important for us parameters are X and Y. So they are the current coordinates of the, the position of the mouse, but the parameters are given in the TWIPS. Uh, TWIPS is the 20th of a point, so it is the Microsoft Access Natural uh, Unit, but our bitmap, of course, is in pixels, so we need to translate uh, that one unit to another. For this, we are using the constant that is called TWIPS per pixel, and, and this constant is also can calculate it, it with use of the library. So first we are calculating something intermediate, which is a pixel per inch. And later, knowing pixel per inch, we are calculating twips per pixels. So here are some code of the sample mouse move and mouse down event handler. So first we see we are converting the param input parameters X and Y to pixels. And later there are some other instructions that I are making use of that calculated X down and Y down parameters, the same with mouse move. So this is end of the chapter three. The next slide is titled putting everything above together. So it will be some kind of further explanation how we can actually discuss a toolbox made working application. But Colin, please let, let me know, is there a good moment for to make some little uh, question answers uh, session or? question that's just been posted, does the code ever have to consider different X and Y resolution? In other words, can it handle changing resolution? Actually, yeah, I know uh, the, uh, means the resolution when the 
default Windows settings are magnified, like two, 250% or something, or 200%. Uh, unfortunately, this example uh, that is given to on the, the hyperlink uh, doesn't contain the feature, but there is one more declare statement and we can bring from operation system the current settings, whether it is 100% or the settings is magnified like 150%, 200%. And accordingly, we can we can uh, multiply the, the coordinates. So bring, uh, for that question, it is possible, but uh, example that is given by me doesn't contain this uh, this feature. I suppose that if you used automatic form resizing with this code, it would rescale automatically as, as anything else does. Neil was talking about dots per inch, uh, which is normally 96. It shouldn't make any difference. So uh, Tim's asked us the TWIPs per pixel constant change on a high definition screen no twips uh, per pixel is a standard constant there are 1440 twips in an inch or 567 in a centimeter so and the ratio to that and pixels and or points is always the same if you'd like to go back to your presentation alexander i will uh, continue with the presentation now we more or less have uh, briefly knowledge how uh, what what are our tools we know how to draw the lines we know how to draw the rectangles we know how to draw the texts but, but how we can put everything together to make something uh, useful so it is the explanation i will be showing the in the same time as uh, explaining the slides i will be showing the working database there are two class modules first one is the important one it is called uh, dt tools uh, canvas and other one is little helper module that contains only the important uh, data for keeping the memory picture maybe i will now open the visual basic code and we'll go through this module as we see here is uh, first are the declaration of the constants like enumerations like the types used by the library later are the declarations of the functions used by the gdi library uh, later still there are the constants that are the equivalent of the numeric variables sometimes it's better to use just the, the name of instead of just numbers so here are some definitions of the things and later we have something that is called internal variables of the class everything that starts from m is just internal private member of this class and here we are keeping all the important data like pointers to the objects and those m underscore members are available for all the functions and methods of that class so, so here is a couple of the declarations and later here are the properties because the class is taking the reference to the image control and to the form so it can react accordingly on to the, the events on the form and later are just usual functions first important are the class initialize which is default method the same is class finalize uh, which is the destructor of the class and lots of the of the functions like draw line deep to picture data is the the function that is copying the memory picture to the picture box it was discussed activate font so we, we can recognize that here we, we see the the draw round rectangle which is the rectangle with round corners uh, uh, this is the function that is returning the twist per pixel and so on so we we can um anyone can later uh, study uh, more in details this uh, this uh, function but but uh, this uh, canvas object if i go to the form of the gantt chart i will take a look here on the very top of the form module we can see this pb object is this canvas object so it is the declaration of that object as well we, we see some utility variables and as well as some some type function but here is the important part anytime the form is loaded the form load event uh, handler is fired we are initializing the new canvas object and later we are 
assigning to this properties uh, image control, we are assigning this image that is uh, used for drawing, and we are as well assigning the reference to the form itself because somehow the library needs to something that as well is used from the form. So so library is capable to refer to some form properties. Later there are some other functions. So maybe I will just come back to the presentation and we will start explaining what are the code, the functions in the code that is responsible for drawing the Gantt chart. So it is already explained that we need to declare this uh, canvas object, which is, which is the major object that allow us to draw uh, the things on our canvas and all the functions are embedded. And in the form load, we are just initializing this object. Later, uh, here is the first table. It is called table jobs. We can see this is standard Microsoft Access table that contain the data of the activities, I mean, the, the work orders, jobs. Um, what is important, uh, of course, there are some text data, but start time and end time are uh, referred here as numbers. Uh, later, I will show there are some uh, hours dictionary that is uh, converting the number to the hour. Ter is the ID of the of the person who is uh, who belongs to that tool and status is as well this ID of the the status uh, x y coordinates this uh, these uh, fields are only used when the uh, activity is on the unassigned area then uh, these x and y coordinates are uh, pointing where is where should be this top left corner of the of the rectangle, maybe I will show briefly. So you see this, this uh, rectangle uh, are placed in this way. So each of them are having different X, Y coordinates. So, so, so this is the way how we are storing the main, uh, main data in our access database. Of course, technicians are, uh, this is, uh, it is the table that holds the information about technicians. We can define uh, for each single day, a different set of technicians. So it is another table. Uh, technicians in day, which contain a set of persons that are available on specific date. And this one is the hour dictionary uh, that I mentioned earlier. So each half of an hour is uh, defined as a different number because as we see, the layout is not allow us to precise periods shorter than half an hour. So only when we do something, it is snapping to the grid to half an hour periods. So we, we have, of course, these uh, data tables, one, two, three, four. And uh, of course, we cannot any time the frame of the drawing is drawn. It is, we cannot uh, read the data from the record set because it is too slow. We need to define some memory arrays that are keeping that object. So I define type employee are the name of employee job is the the fields here are the same uh, in the type uh, are the same as the fields in the table and i defined constant size of this array but i believe we can use as well the redeem preserve uh, when we are feeding the array with the data and the last one type is called layout job because whenever we are drawing something something on layout it needs to remember where the job is drawn to, to react accordingly on the mouse movement. So, so the layout jobs is something that is remembering the actual X, Y position of the rectangle while it is drawn. It is important because here is the vertical scroll bar. So whenever the scroll bar is not in the very top position, the X, Y coordinates are changing. So this layout job is for keeping the actual position of specific job on the layout. So it is allow us later react on and identify if some of the activity, some of the rectangle is below our mouse pointer. So, so here, here we have the, the jobs, the, the types, and here is the way how we are populate these arrays. This one is just hard coded. It is just mentioned uh, what are the, the hours. Here is something uh, that is just opening standard TAO record set and just looping through that record set and populating this uh, memory array. 
And the same story is with this jobs and jobs table. It's just selecting the data from this jobs table. There is some kind of join because it need as well remember the, the name of the technician, but, but anyway, we can assume it's just simple record set and we are looping through this record set and filling in the, the memory array. Last thing is the background because the background of the of the layout, as we see, here is some thicker lines are indicator of the hours. The light gray lines are the indicators of half of an hour, but this one is actually picture. So it is shown how the pictures looks like, and the picture is first it is loaded from the from the path where the main Microsoft Access file is lo located. And later it is anytime the new frame of the layout is drawn, first operation is just pasting this picture. And later, accordingly on this picture, there are drawn the rectangles that contain the activities and the technician names and so on. Now it's the part to discuss the, how the the draw procedure works because anytime something is going on, if we move mouse or someone is click uh, clicking on the uh, layout, it is always called this procedure draw. So first operation is just draw the memory picture as the layout. Later is called the procedure draw employees. It is populating this area of the screen. By default, it is gray, but uh, with this blue blue rectangles. When we have uh, less technicians in some day, there is not all the rectangles are filled in and we will see this gray area behind. And last operation is draw jobs and draw hours at top. So these uh, rectangles with the hours as, are as well uh, drawn with the light bar. So maybe now on the right, we can see how is how looks the drawn name because here is the procedure that is looping through the employees table and is just using one more function draw rectangle. And as parameter is the name of the employee and position. I mean, position is the, the row and the color. And here is the final drawing. So, so we can assume this is the draw employees. So here is the draw employees function. And it is just, uh, that just contain the for loop that is looping through the memory array. And for each of the item in the memory array, it's called draw name rectangle. That is actually drawing the rectangle and we see her first is activated the font, later is calculated the coordinates of the rectangle. And of course there is the draw rectangle function. Here are the corners of the rectangle are accordingly written as a calculate result of calculations. And finally, we are putting as well the name of the technician. So here, uh, this is the way how the very low level drawing operations are made. And the same is uh, with the, I repeat the draw function. Now I am discussing this draw jobs procedure and draw jobs is the same. We are just going through the jobs uh, memory table and we are calling for each of the item, something like that, draw job rectangle. And we're passing all the data that are in the memory tables. So here we see how looks the procedure in details. So first it is somehow calculating the coordinates of the background. Later is drawing the background rectangle. And later, this part is important. I put this red indicator. This part is after the rectangle is drawn, it is remembering the current position of the drawn rectangle in the layout jobs memory table. It will be important because this table is anytime we are moving our mouse over layout, it is scanning this table and verifying if our mouse pointer is over some of these layout rectangles. And here are just uh, the text. Here we have three line of text. First is the unit number, customer name, and description. So this is the three, three something is unit number and description and client number. So all the, the three details are placed here. The middle is with bold font. So here is the activating of font. So font bold is true for the middle text and for the top and bottom text, it is just regular on style. Yeah, so it is the way how in general the drawing procedure looks like. And here is the explanation how the mouse movement are done. So here is the, on the very left, we see the event handler of this image zero. Image zero is just this image that is keeping our picture. So we are first 
uh, translating these coordinates x and y to the pixels and later it is verifying if the mouse button is right mouse button it is doing an action but it's it is waiting for the pop-up um pop up right click mouse menu uh, to appear but we will discuss later how the right click menu is is uh, served uh, in this application but in case the left button is uh, clicked is left mouse button it is just running these procedures for if mouse move 12 11 10 there accordingly when mouse 12 is for left we on we resize left corner 11 right corner and 10 is when we are moving hold the rectangle as as one and this explanation how looks the verify mouse state so it is it is going through this memory table layout counter layout counter, counter is the counter of the memory activities and for each of the activities it is verifying if the current coordinate that is our mouse position is somewhere uh, interferes somehow with the with the position of the la memory layout rectangle so first it is verifying if this outside here is if this next to the left edge of the rectangle here it is verifying if this next to the right edge of uh, rectangle and accordingly it's uh, mouse state one is the that for this specific activity we are outside near x1 i mean the left border is three right border is four and default is two. So if no of any of this condition is met, it is just returning this default result as two. So it is the way how the, the procedure of mouse move is, is working. The same is with mouse up and mouse down. So anytime we are clicking our mouse button, there is launch a handler mouse down. And we are first thing we are converting the coordinates and later in the same way we are verifying on which area the mouse is located because as you see when i my mouse is here there is no action to perform when my mouse is somewhere on the white area it's at new job but when the job is activated it is showing this one job uh, properties or uh, remove job but when we are on the left bar it is uh, showing this menu this part of code is responsible to to verify the state of the menu and show accordingly the the proper right mouse drop down menu but in case the, the mouse button is one it is doing this part of the code and in the same way mouse up because when we are moving something like this mouse down is was done first it is uh, now it is showing the it is moving the, the rectangle and later when i use the mouse up button then there is another procedure that is calculating the final position of this rectangle so it is the way how we can use this mouse down and mouse up event handlers to make some uh, accordingly uh, some calculations in for our uh, layout and now it is the place where is described how we can embed the right click uh, menu it is i think very old there are some other options as well but i use this technique that uh, in the form properties i put in the shortcut menu bar the name of the macro that is defined as the main macro of the uh, right menu so we are we are defining just regular macro object and in this macro it is following code so the date of right menu is the code uh, that was uh, that was discussed earlier but here is set state of right menu but visual basic code is setting the state and the macro is taking the the state of right menu and when it is one it's just showing the disposition of menu i mean this one right click employee uh, later right click grid so here the other macros are the definitions of the position of the context menu right right mouse click menu and this is a little example how looks the right click employee so it is manage employees move technician up move technician down so it is it is actually this menu that came after uh, we click somewhere on this left in area yeah and the last light um, it is just information that because the code is intensively going through the memory arrays it is important to set the macros on the enable all macros uh, we can do it in three three possible ways one first way is just to set this code in our microsoft access 
Second option is just to use the trusted location because trusted location is assumed to be safe. So the, the code is running fast. And the third pos- option is just to use the, the certificate that is we can sign our code by certificate and then the code is working as well fast. This is interesting because uh, I was making some investigation together with Colin because this feature in Microsoft Office was introduced relatively recently it is just when we don't use trusted location and when and if we use this uh, option disable all macros with notification and even we enable the macros there is some kind of security guide in the code that is looking on each instruction and verifying if it is not dangerous for us and it is significantly slowing down the code so to have an, a good impression of the code it is advised to, to set this macro settings as, as following or use the trusted location mm-hmm. and last one thing i will mention that as you notice when i do something the screen is flickering but i I noticed a time ago the, the the screen is only flickering when we do some changes in the visual basic code. But after we close the database completely and reopen again the same the same code, it will not flicker. So I'm doing once again I'm opening. So now when the access uh, file was closed completely and reopened. A flickering effect is no longer available. But as long as soon as we go to Visual Basic and we change something, it starts flickering. But it's pretty natural uh, behavior. But after we close and reopen, it starts working nice as before. More or less, it is kind. Of, I, I believe it is kind of rather of brief explanation of the technique I I was using. Thank you very much for paying attention. And of course, if someone has questions, I'm happy to to answer. Alexander, that was absolutely amazing. And your mastery of the subject is incredible. There's been a lot of conversation about that flickering that you that you just mentioned and I thought it was a zoom artifact because I couldn't replicate it on my own computer with your app and you've just explained about the VBE being the issue there so first of all before we go any further and come back to any questions can I just ask anyone who knows how to use the reaction thing please do a round of applause or a thumbs up or anything like that, just to show how much you appreciated what I thought was an absolutely superb presentation. And I have to say, I wish I understood the use of APIs, even though I use them a lot. I wish I understood them as well as you do, because that really was very clear and very impressive. Going back through the questions then, Tim asked a question about Flickr. There's been a lot of exchange about that. I assume, Tim, you're happy with the answer that you've got. If you've got any follow-ups there, please let me know. Neil commented, first time I've seen a good reason to use a macro, which made me laugh as I read that. Right. Another question, is the data only saved back to the tables on completion of a save? In other words, if you're dragging a green box, let's say from one place to another, is it saving repeatedly or just on mouse up? No, no. Yeah. That, that uh, your uh, thinking is, uh, is, is very correct. It's going as long as the, as the rectangle is not dropped in the new position, the data in the table are as they were before the movement start. So, so only the update is, is made uh, when we are releasing the, the rectangle. Great. Otherwise, there would be a lot of data being written for no purpose at all, and it would affect a performance. So that's what I assumed was the right answer there. I thought that was superb there. I think, is there any other questions? Yes, there's been wows, huge smiles, awesomes. Ken asked, is the GDI API library available in all older versions of Windows? Well, I don't know what version you're talking about, Ken. It's certainly a version available in 7, wasn't it? And I think before that, it's it's a very old library, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, it's interesting that I read some details about that, but it was fully software rendered in the Windows XP, but in Windows 7 and later, they, I mean, Microsoft guys, rewrite the inside of that library to make the drawing operation more efficient, but still the 
outside of the library, like the declaration of the functions are still the same. So I was using Windows XP, uh, it was in Windows 7, it is in Windows uh, 10. I, I have an, uh, guys who are using Windows 11 as well, and it is also available. So I think it is kind of very low level part of operating system Windows. So uh, it will be available forever, I believe, as long as Windows. Jeff has just said it was available since Windows 95. So I think if you've got Windows 3.1, about time you updated, really. So anyway, that's pretty impressive. There is a GDI Plus library as well, which has got additional functionality, but this is the original GDI 32 library. Very good there. Right. David Neely has said the reason for storing previous data is so the users can go back later and understand when tasks were reassigned. Um, that's extremely important in project management. Yes, I understand that question, David, but it would make the performance absolutely impossible if you stored every single change. It would just, it would give you a huge amount of data, but little value, I think. Crystal's said, yes, she looks forward to actually using these tools here. She's done a lot of code on reports and not for forms. So she appreciates sharing the code. Um, and we'll test this out. Undoubtedly on your PowerPoint, you had your email address there. Uh, you'd be willing to answer questions if people uh, wish to ask you but, things later on. Uh, but I would like to extend a little bit uh, the question um, given by Crystal uh, that in GDI, there is possibility to export this memory picture to just bitmap file on the disk. So we can, if we would like to make a report that contains this uh, layout, we can just uh, make an export that layout to be bitmap. And in the fly, when the report is loaded, just load the picture, uh, the bitmap picture into our report. So it is the way how we can put the image, dynamically created image in our report. So, so it is possible, but not straight, but some additional step is needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. I, I really appreciate your presentation. And I guess my big confusion is when it comes to forms, it seems that we need controls. And I don't quite understand what you presented. I need to watch the video again. But you did drag and drop which seems like you need a control to do that. Whereas I've been doing a lot of drawings on reports and you can draw like a lot of objects that you can't reference in code because they're not really objects. So you draw a line or you draw a rectangle or you draw this or you draw that, but you can't call it up and change its properties. So I'm wondering if they're, these libraries that you're pulling in are actually giving forms that ability too. But uh, if I properly understood, uh, whenever something is drawn with the library, they are just primitive shapes like rectangles, like text. So we, we don't have any real references to that object. It's just, it became as pixels uh, on the bitmap. So to have an uh, information where something is stored in the time when we are drawing this, like this rectangle, we are creating something that is called a layout activity. The layout activity is some additional memory table that is keeping the current information of the position of that object. So next to the bitmap, we are having another memory array that contains all the coordinates of all the rectangles that were drawn on the pictures. We can assume that it is blind man, you know, blind man is not capable to see anything, but he's capable to touch, you know. So the when we are doing mouse movement, the library is going through the memory of layout activities where all the coordinates are coordinates of the rectangles are saved. We can compare that it is trying to touch if there is something or there's nothing. So if it detects there is something under mouse move, it is looking in this memory array of the coordinates of the object. So it is maybe maybe I will come back to the slide where this is this was explained. Here is the actual drawing uh, operation. So now it is just uh, calculating the position of the rectangle. So first it is top is uh, 123 is the beginning of the, the grid. And uh, now it is row minus one times 39 because each row, row is 39 pixels plus 
uh, y because y is the the coordinate of the when we are dragging something it is dragging this in an assigned area we have this additional coordinates that is making the difference when the tiles that are placed one over another and so here is a calculated left position and here's calculated right position and bottom position is oh someone is drawing something oh nice I, I noticed something. Ah, because I'm not sure if, if my mouse pointer is visible for, for you. Or... Yes, it, yes, it is. Ah, all right. So, yes, yeah. so row zero, it is the calculation of this unassigned area. But here are the calculation of the regular area. So top, left, right. And now here is the at the bottom. Where is the bot ah, bottom is top plus 39 because uh, as uh, height is 39, so bottom is always top plus 39. So we know exact coordinates of the uh, top, left, right, and bottom of this rectangle. So now we are drawing this rectangle. So it is the place. And later, after the rectangle is drawn, we are. This is, oh, here is the place. Remember current dispatch position into array of layout jobs. So it is the way. So it should be, I think, maybe more clean to extend, uh, redeem this array. But I'm using the array has constant size, but just increasing the, the counter. So it's to remember the position. And here we are just remembering the current position of the already drawn rectangle. So this layout jobs is the array that keeps the current positions of the rectangle. And while we are moving our mouse, so mouse move, here is the verify mouse state. So mouse state is something to detect if the mouse is over something or the mouse is over the empty area. We are going to uh, through this layout job. So we are confrontation, a kind of confrontation. We are putting current X and Y coordinates of the of current mouse position and the layout job. So right, uh, layout job contains the coordinates of the current job. And here is the place where we are verifying if the mouse is over the rectangle. So first we are assuming it is inside the job, means that the, our mouse pointer is inside. But in the case, our current mouse position is lower than the layout job. So our mouse is on the left from the rectangle or our mouse is to the right of the edge of the rectangle, or our mouse is Y coordinate is low, less than Y position. So it is assuming it is outside. But in case this criteria is met, it is not giving up yet, but because it is still verify, making one more verification deeper. If the, we are close to the left or right edge of the, of the rectangle, maybe I will so to demonstrate it, oh, so now nothing is nothing happens. But now it assumes that it is we are inside the rectangle. But when I move my mouse uh, to the right, because I think there are three pixels of difference, the, the margin of the to detect right edge. I think three or five pixels. It is this absolute is just to to verify the difference. If the difference is less than three, it means that if if the our current mouse position is and difference between uh, y coordinate, uh, sorry, x coordinate is less than three. It is changing the the cursor to these arrows, uh, horizontal arrows. So it is actually the mouse state is like that. This is for whole uh, rectangle change, and left, right are just more uh, detail detection of the position. So this is the x1, x2 position. I think this is uh, some kind of uh, explanation how we can detect later the position of the objects because right the picture. Uh, it's just pixels. We cannot identify anything in the pixels. Alexander, I think bearing in mind the time, I'm going to interrupt you here. Your explanations, somebody else has just commented, are absolutely superb. I uh, just want to pass on a comment that Jeff Griffiths looked up on chat GBT when GDI was introduced, and apparently Windows 1.0. I'm not sure I always trust what chat GBT says, but it has been around a long, long time, mm -hmm. and yet I don't think anyone has ever gone into the details of it so much in one of these presentations. That's superb. I don't know if you can do it in less than two minutes. You did show me something with a sort of a web hybrid version of this. Is that available or do you, do you want to leave that? Yes, yes. Hey, hey, before you go into that, Colin, I just want to say thank you, Alexander. Brilliant presentation and great explanation. 
Thank I you. very much look forward to studying your code and thank you so very much for sharing it. Awesome. And thank you, Colin and Alessandro. Access Europe constantly has excellent presentations and it's nice to be here live and ask questions. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I think we, what you said is shared by everybody who's watched this in terms of the quality of this. Yeah, so I will make some little actual use of that driver because still that that previous example we can assume is kind of template that can be extended to make a real use of business application. But but maybe I, I will show that kind of application I'm, I'm developing with use of that uh, techniques. Uh, this application is for a real uh, company that is, is making home or uh, rooms reconstructions like bathrooms or the others lots of uh, technicians and business cases so we see um, this is a calendar here but this is some kind of more advanced template it is uh, there is as well zoom in zoom out um, feature implemented but more or less the, the basics are the same here and and of course is another uh, gantt chart so we can see there are some technicians here are the the project and of course uh, the mouse is as well interactive so anytime we we do something i, I don't want to, to to change anything because they are the <laughs> business data but but yeah and, and of course if, if we double click we see there are some, some information related to that project yeah. would you if people people seem so impressed that i wonder whether they would be look forward to seeing a later presentation where you go into the some of these other things sometime in a few months time I don't know how popular that would be if it would you if that is popular is that something we could discuss later um if you would like to see that somebody said yes please and if anyone else is interested in that yes please do put it in the chat now I am going to have to interrupt you though Alexander I apologize oh, uh, that's sure. So, so if you'd like to remove that screen, I'm going to take over sharing. Mm -hmm. I showed this at the beginning. Alexander's got an old YouTube channel with some of this stuff demonstrated. On my website today, I added the PowerPoint and the two demos in Access that Alexander did. And I will add them as one single file on the Access Europe user group site as well later on. Alexander, thank you again. That was an absolutely amazingly impressive session and it leaves a lot for anyone to follow that. But luckily we have. One Ho Luna is one of our most recent MVPs, even more of a baby than me, uh, at least in terms of how long he's been an MVP. He is actually, although based in Austria, he is Spanish and is the president or chair of the Access Espana group, uh, which also meets monthly. And uh, next month, he's going to be talking about something which I know even less about than, than most of these topics, which is Blazor. I know nothing at all other than that symbol. Wanho, do you want to briefly tell us about what you're going to do next month? And thank you for making it despite having another meeting. Yeah, really, uh, of course. Uh, first of all, sorry for my English. Don't worry, in the meeting will uh, George Young uh, translate my presentation. But I will speak a little bit about Blazor. What is Blazor? Blazor is a framework that make able to make an easy program to make uh, mobile applications. It is uh, so uh, usually that we hear we listen that access had not the possibility to make mobile applications. But we have uh, applications that works in, in access and we need a solution for our clients. What can we do about that? And that's a possibility for the access developers to make a, a little and easy app with laser. I will demonstrate how easy it's for a developer from Access, make a new application with Laser. It's about C Sharp, but it's really so easy. I will demonstrate in our how it's possible for you a new app in a new technology make. I think it's really interesting, and uh, I hope I will help you about that question that we have. Uh, always. How can we make when a client needs a solution in the cloud with access?
of course. Thank you, Anho. Uh, looking forward to that tremendously as well. Thank you, Alexander, for an uh, absolutely superb application today. And when I asked the question about if anyone would like to see a follow-up, I got about 10 people immediately saying, I'd be interested, give me more, that would be great, brilliant. So the answer would appear to be, yes, if I can persuade you to come back at some future date, that would be much appreciated by all. You can download both of those two Gantt chart apps, the GDI one and the proper Gantt one there, as well as the PowerPoint. So it's all available for you and it's free. This has been a really well attended session. Thanks again for everybody. And I will see you all next month, I hope, for One Ho. Yes.